On today's show, a few of our artful favorites. Outdoor gear made right here in the Northland. Up first, we meet the minds behind Ely's most recognized winter coats. See how this craftsman shapes wood to become family heirlooms. And a fishtail come true in one Northwood shop. Minnesota Bound. Brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC Dealers. Hey everybody, Laura and I welcome you to Minnesota Bound. Today we share a few stories of some of our favorite homespun outdoor products. Yeah, locally made gear that people tend to really love. We're starting up in Ely where a trip to the North Pole changed the way people dressed. To understand is to step into Sue Shirky's shop. Cold are the months of winter, a time when everything seems to slow down. But up north in the town of Ely, listen, hear it? There is buzz, and I know it's really something. Seems everyone's talking about this Minnesota sewing shop. It's a northern Minnesota thing. Oh, it's bigger than that. It is wintergreen northern wear, homespun and handmade outdoor gear from Ely. People actually save up their money to buy a wintergreen jacket. Wintergreen's story stretches literally from the North Pole to the South. Sue Shirky on the left there might best explain. The very first anorak I made was for Paul on the Steger International North Pole Expedition in 1986. See, Paul Shirky, Sue's husband, needed a coat to get him safely to the North Pole. So, Sue sewed him one. Then, she sewed another, and eventually, one more. I wasn't really a good seamstress. Uh, it would take me maybe three months to make one garment and get it right. I might make it six times over until I got it right for somebody. Point was, Sue made really good winter coats and people wanted them. All over Europe, uh, people going to the North and South Poles in particular. Winter Green became an iconic brand. Maybe it's the Scandinavian trim, sort of the autograph of all winter green gear. Or maybe it's the people. <laughs> Folks like Laverne Ellis. Yesterday was um, 22 years. I started February 1st, 1993. Laverne's been sewing wintergreen clothes a long time. <laughs> Even now, she still tries to spot for work. I'll walk up to some people sometimes and say, can I look at your jacket? <laughs> Why? And it's like, well, I think I made it. But it's wintergreen. It's like, yeah. The whole process starts with raw sheets of fabric and a guy with a glove. The glove I wear to keep from cutting my fingers off. This is an extremely razor sharp blade. It goes up and down. Dave Nelson cuts coat pieces. 8, 16, 32, about, about 50 jackets and cut right now. Each section hand cut from patterns designed in house. I am working on a pair of Expedition Shell Bib Pants. We created the pattern already in a size medium and now I'm upgrading it to size large. Once workers have all the coat parts cut, they go into individual bags. Think ingredients of a recipe, unique to each garment in each size. From there, Laverne and her team join the parts to create one whole garment. You don't want to get your fingers stuck in there. Every time somebody gets a garment, they know who they're making it for. And they make the garment from start to finish. And there's a bit of a relationship. A relationship Sue and this town missed. You see, 
Sue sold Wintergreen back in 2009. The brand quickly dwindled and eventually the lights went dark. Last year, at an auction, Sue showed up to buy one of Wintergreen's old sewing machines, and something happened. Sue pulled out her purse and bought everything back. I actually missed it, and I missed working with the folks here, and I also missed the community, so. The Shirkies brushed off the dusk, and Wintergreen reopened, renewed. So now, Maybe you understand the buzz. A story of passion sown in the heart of the North Woods. It's fun to be back. Coming up next, Heat helped shape vintage Minnesota gear. The legacy work of this North Woods crew next. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC Dealers, Rapala Ice Force, Star Bank, and by Hewitt Docks, Lifts, and Pontoon Lakes. So this is the Shirk family toboggan, steamed, shaped, and finished by my grandfather way back in 1975. Now, homemade toboggans like this are a little bit rare these days, exactly why Ron Sherrod decided to head north to War Road. In War Road, Minnesota, Winter's snowy blanket makes everything seem peaceful. Here at this quiet backyard workshop, the day is just getting started. And for the Heron family business, let's just say the snowy conditions are perfect. This one's too short. We shoot to get them like 16 foot one. John Heron is a craftsman of a winter tradition that's centuries old, making wooden toboggans by hand. My understanding is that wooden sleds showed up in Canada about the time of the fur trade, so it was probably a European influence and the first sleds were toboggans that were pulled by hand for a hunter on snowshoes. A carpenter by trade, Heron credits his uncle for getting him into the toboggan business. John's uncle had heard of a toboggan shortage in the 1990s and encouraged John to take up an apprenticeship with a respected toboggan maker who lived in Manitoba, Canada. It's a tool, I guess I think it was a tool. The people that are buying our toboggans don't have a lot of resource, but it's, it's a major purchase for them. It's a main thing. They, they need a snowmobile to travel there and they need a sled. It's not an extra thing or it's not like a, a hobby thing or uh, you know sporting goods or anything like that. It's a, it's a part of a necessity. We put a taper in the end that's going to be bent. John mastered the craft, and Northern Toboggan and Sled was born. Since then, toboggan building has been a family affair. We make toboggans. We've always made toboggans, I guess, as, about as far back as I can remember. Um, it's just been our family farm. It's just been something that uh, my dad does, and, and we help out along the way as, as much as we can. And while John is now master craftsman, his work highly regarded, it's time for him to share the art of toboggan making, after all. There's the steam chamber right there. He's the only one who can. Who make them commercially to supply. I think I'm the last guy. The stuff is bending pretty nice. Oh. We call it a bending jig. That's what gives you the leverage to bend the board, but also that's how the board is stored until it's dried. Can you get that end, Hammond? 
While John's children take part in other areas of the business, he needed to find an artisan of wood, like himself. What's really going to be key is that we get the right apprentice in here, a person who is going to learn the trade and uh, enjoy doing it. Meet 26-year-old Ammon Jeffs, the apprentice. I really enjoy learning these skills from the things that have been done for years and years, to know how it was done, instead of losing the ways it was done before. That's a way to put it. John and Ammon have been working side by side in the shop since last fall, teaching and learning the art. Is that clown still tight? Yes. If we didn't keep it up, it would be a lost art. It would be. Yeah. Like many other arts from even one or two centuries ago. And Ammon's getting to know more about the people that are getting them, the end user, those communities. The result is the art of toboggan making will not be lost. John and Eamon will see to that. All right, she's done. Closed captioning is brought to you by Connecticut. Today we look at a few of our outdoor crafters. Many people carve fish and duck decoys, but few do it like the Whittiers. Rick Whittier fishes. This is why I do what we do. But never did he ever think angling could keep him awake at night. With uh, liking fishing, it just fell into place. Rick Whittier's story starts in a dusty North Dakota basement. This is white pine. Down here, Rick and his wife grind away their days, so to speak. Average day I start working around noon. And from there, I, I work till anywhere from five to seven in the morning. Boy, he doesn't like to let me sleep. <laughs> At least 16 to 18 hours, seven days a week. See, the Whittiers have become rather well known for their up all night antics. It is the art of the decoy. Well, we were hoping we were gonna be semi-retired. That didn't work very well for us. Woodworking always has been a release for me. Yes, yes, through the law enforcement years. Way back, Rick, a deputy sheriff, met the dispatcher. They eventually married and worked nights. When the Whittiers hung up their law enforcement caps, Rick retired to the basement. Fish decoys suddenly appeared from raw blocks of wood. I have pictures of some of his first decoys. <laughs> They're not nice looking. That was then, this is now. People come week after week down here to see what I do and, and after nine years I find it boring and I don't understand why, why can't you do this? Well, the paint booth might provide an answer. Watch this. In a matter of seconds, Rick uses plain old cans of color to mist life into his decoys. No special tools, no airbrush. No, I've never used one. I don't know how. <laughs> A lot of people think I'm crazy, but I love what I do, and I love the fact that these guys want them and that they're using them. <laughs> that might be an understatement. On a regular basis, Australia, Britain, South Africa, China. The Whittiers now ship decoys worldwide. I make a minimum of 200 a month. 
which is why unbelievable demand forced Rick to share his hobby with White Connie. So he tried to teach me how to carve, and he said, no, you were right. You, I can't teach you. I never used to allow her down here, but yeah, you know, she's really good at what she does now. Connie also tank tests each fish. Rick finishes with eyes and an autograph. They are all signed. Yes, they are. Every one of them and dated. And then they ship off to faraway places out there for anglers and collectors alike. We're putting a lot of decoys out there, and they'll always be out there. They'll always be talked about uh, whether I'm here or gone. It's more important for me that they use them. It really is, that they're enjoying them. It's functional art. <laughs> Funny thing, even during late night hours. Another order. The phone still rings. Maybe they need a secretary. If you apply, <laughs> just plan on working nights. We are absolute night owls, without a doubt. My hours are a little odd. My hours are a little odd. Still ahead, a Minnesota-bound classic dedicated to the art of crafting nets. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Ice Castle Fish Houses and by Totem Resorts, the premier destination for world-class fishing. Today's Minnesota Bound Classic takes Ron Shera back to a day where he met a Minnesota craftsman. A guy who shapes locally grown wood to swoop up big fish. When you're busy landing a fish, the net is probably the last thing on your mind. There we go. Oh, that's a dandy. Not so for Lloyd Howderjarvey. Landing nets have to come from somewhere. In this case, Howderjarvey is searching the woods for just the right tree, for just the right landing net. I'm always keeping my eye open, whether I'm out partridge hunting, or just walking in the woods, trout fishing in the summertime, I'm always keeping an eye peeled. No, I'm no scientist, just a, just a woodaholic. Years ago, Lloyd, the woodsmith, turned his Duluth basement into a landing net manufacturing plant. Foresters call these crusty bumps on a tree a burl. It's wood to discard, but not in Lloyd's wood-talented hands. Lloyd discovered there's hidden beauty in the unwanted burls. Spray them with water, and the wood grain comes alive. But each burl has its own quirks, you know, its own unique uh, qualities. Almost like snowflakes, um, they have their similarities, but each one of them is different. Each one, absolutely each one is different. And each one will become a different handle for his landing net works of art. Handcrafted items aren't supposed to be perfect. They're not stamped out on a machine. Instead, Lloyd uses patience with wood, a little glue, and eventually the frame comes together. After some sanding and some more sanding. You can fool your eyes, but you can't fool your fingers. And then some more sanding. Lloyd applies varnish to the handle and the natural pattern in the wood is revealed. This is a piece of quilted maple. Very unusual figure in it. Imagine a fish landing net suitable for framing. He makes dozens of net handles a year, but it's not just a business. I enjoy what I'm doing, there's no doubt about that. It's, uh, I put a little extra effort into these, into my, into my product here. I hope it shows, I think it shows. Um, it's just an addiction for me you, you have to, when you get right down to it. If you think about it, Lloyd's handiwork fits right in. Some days it takes a perfect cast in a perfect setting to catch that perfect fish. Why not land it? with a perfect net. That's a perfect Those are some pretty cool nets. And last time we had checked in, he is still making them. Well, that about does it for us today. We'll see you back here next week. In the meantime, don't forget to introduce a kid to the great outdoors.
Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433.